I want you to try something for me. Take a sip of this. What is it? A human drink. It's called root beer. Uh, I don't know. Come on. Aren't you just a little bit curious? <sighs> What do you think? It's vile. I know. It's so bubbly and cloying and happy. Just like the Federation. But you know what's really frightening? If you drink enough of it, you begin to like it. It's insidious. Just like the Federation. Do you think they'll be able to save us? I hope so. Suppose you are faced with a threat so massive, so cataclysmic, that the fate of the universe hinges on its defeat. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. Suppose, through luck or perseverance, that you are given a chance to eliminate that threat with the push of a button. A precise hit will start a chain reaction which should destroy the station. We could introduce an invasive programming sequence through its biochip system, and then return it to the hive. Borg is so interconnected it would act like a virus. Which would infect the entire collective. What do you do? In Star Wars, of course, the answer to that question has become a third act cliche, which should come as no surprise to anyone who can read the title. But in Star Trek, well, things tend to go a little differently. Don't you understand, Hugh? We're giving you a choice. Choice? Yes, a choice. Do you want to go back with the Borg? Or stay with us? What's interesting about the decision to spare Hugh's life is that, unlike the way Star Wars paints moments like these as unequivocally joyous and uncomplicated victories, here it's burdened with an uneasy ambivalence. There is the knowledge that, had they chosen to sacrifice him instead, Billions of innocent lives would certainly be spared. But thanks to you, there are very few of us left. We're scattered throughout the galaxy. We don't even have a home anymore. In fact, given that the Borg originate from the Delta Quadrant and have terrorized such a vast stretch of real estate, the total sum of saved lives is incalculable to a degree that is mind-boggling. There is also uncertainty in whether the sentience and individuality they chose to preserve will survive. Does that seem right, to help him become an individual and then take that away from him? Or whether they simply condemned Hugh to oblivion. But perhaps in that short time before they purge his memory, the sense of individuality which he has gained with us might be transmitted through the entire Borg Collective. And if he does survive, what consequences will come of it? Well, we'll deal with the repercussions later. Indeed, the fallout from this decision spans across three television shows, one movie, and three time periods. In hindsight, this decision seems pretty difficult to justify, especially considering Spock's most famous Vulcan precept. Logic clearly dictates that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. So what gives? Hi, I'm Rafa, and as I mentioned at the end of part one, Star Trek embraces moral doubt and ambiguity. But it was the moral thing to do. Well, it may turn out that the moral thing to do was not the right thing to do. And it is that comfort with ethical tension that is key to understanding Picard's decision. Where the Jedi divide the world into a stark moral binary of light and dark, inspired by the philosophical convictions of medieval Europe and Asia, Starfleet takes its cues from a period in human history far less interested in ancient, eternal wisdom. The Enlightenment, an era characterized by a breathless enthusiasm for discovery. Great thinkers in the fields of philosophy, science, and art pushed to expand humanity's understanding of the world, seeking new answers to ancient questions. Religious orthodoxy was challenged, and the concepts of reason, liberty, tolerance, and secularism found widespread popularity across the Western world. It was an era of exploration, both geographic and intellectual. 
Philosopher Immanuel Kant's famous usage of the Latin phrase sapere aude, meaning dare to know, epitomized the zeitgeist within the intelligentsia. All of this might sound vaguely familiar. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise, its continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. The Starfleet officers we get to know throughout the Star Trek franchise tend to be polymaths, constantly showing off an impressive range of expertise in a variety of fields. I'm a graduate of Starfleet Academy. I know many things. Picard, for instance, is an expert in archaeological knowledge spanning dozens, if not hundreds, of alien civilizations. This object is over 12,000 years old. He is also an expert historian. The European hegemony. A loose alliance formed in the early part of the 22nd century. It was the first stirrings of world government. You should read more history, number one. A literary connoisseur. And he piled on the whale's white hump. The sum of all the rage and hate felt by his whole race. If his chest had been a cannon, he would have shot his heart upon it. A fantastic lawyer and diplomat. Then I hereby declare this treaty in abeyance. Wait. Negotiation is permissible. A talented fencer and martial artist. And he even finds the time to learn music while captaining the most important ship in the fleet. He bears a striking similarity to figures like Isaac Newton and René Descartes, brilliant luminaries who lived at a time when the sciences were so young, it was possible for one person to have encyclopedic knowledge of all its fields. Do not patronize me, sir. I invented physics. When Star Trek revisits the past, which it does frequently, it's not to find some lost wisdom, but rather to revere people who were known for significantly advancing human thought or changing history for the better. That is, when it's not using history as a clear warning against that to which we must never return. In the 20th century, humans used crude nuclear reactors as weapons. They called them atom bombs. Uh, they used to blow them up all the time. They irradiated their own planet? All of this is to say that Star Trek's idea of truth is one that is constantly evolving, consciously constructed and modified with experience and exposure to different cultures and ways of life. While the Federation has rather strong convictions regarding reason, liberty, and secularism as forming the foundation of an ethical society, and are frequently pretty arrogant about it too. Your report describes how rational these people are millennia ago. They abandoned their belief in the supernatural. Now you are asking me to sabotage that achievement, to send them back into the dark ages of superstition and ignorance and fear? No! The Federation also strongly believes that tolerance of other cultures and respect for their autonomy takes absolute precedence over any kind of evangelism this vision of a human utopia might encourage. This naturally creates a huge opportunity for contradiction that the shows used to create the majority of their conflicts, particularly for characters living in between worlds. Worf, for example, often struggles with reconciling what is moral and honorable for a Klingon. Avis Blade speed you on your journey. And what is moral and honorable for a Starfleet officer? Sir, I realize my actions were in violation of Starfleet regulations, but... Regulations? We're not talking about some obscure technicality, Mr. Worf. You tried to commit premeditated murder. The frequent accidental and deliberate violations of the Prime Directive, the principle of non-interference that is Starfleet's core rule of engagement, is a direct result of how vaguely defined it is. The Prime Directive forbids us to interfere with the social order of any planet. No identification of self or mission. No interference with the social development of said planet. No references to space or the fact that there are other worlds or more advanced civilizations. We cannot allow our presence to alter this planet's natural course of events. Even if the natural course of events is annihilation? Yeah. The Star Trek programs do not hesitate to demonstrate that not interfering with a society's culture or its technological advancement is nowhere near as cut and dry as it might seem in theory. Nonetheless, the Prime Directive, inseparable from the Federation's stated commitment to pacifism, is the one thing that keeps the Federation from becoming, well, for lack of a better word, evil. In Starfleet, 
the Federation wields a dauntingly powerful military that also functions as its primary conduit for exploration and political expansion. That bears a striking resemblance to our era of Western imperialism and colonialism, where exploration, military conquest, and the brutal exploitation of people indigenous to faraway lands were often synonymous. Without the Prime Directive, what would stop the Federation from becoming the Borg? Star Trek has a rich roster of antagonists. The Romulans, the Cardassians, the Klingons, the Zindi, the Dominion. But none of them hold a mirror to our heroes quite the way the Borg do. Like the Federation, the Borg are a massive military power, technologically advanced, and completely committed to a form of collectivism bereft of currency. Money doesn't exist in the 24th century. But while the Federation performs a dizzying balancing act between the needs of the individual and the greater good, I've also had to consider that a decision to grant asylum and the subsequent suicide of a Q might have a significant impact on the continuum. That such a decision could change the nature of an entire society, whether it be a favorable or unfavorable change, disturbs me greatly. But then there are the rights of the individual in this matter. I don't believe that you are mentally unbalanced. And I do believe that you are suffering intolerably. The Borg have completely sacrificed the individual, assimilating everything useful from a culture into their literal collective consciousness. Their entire mission is to interfere with everything and everyone, firm in their belief that assimilation is the only way to live. When you are assimilated, you will have a similar device. Hugh, do you understand we don't want to be assimilated? Why do you resist us? And since it requires the destruction of every individual identity and the purging of their culture, it is unquestionably a form of genocide. Which brings us, finally, to Hugh and the ethical crisis surrounding him. The needs of the many don't just include the victims of the Borg. They also include the Borg. To ignore the right for their entire civilization to exist, to annihilate it for the sake of your people. To use him in this manner we be no better than the enemy that we seek to destroy. Or to as Cisco puts it. So you're willing to destroy paradise in order to save it? Because of its ethical sensibilities and idealistic ambitions, the franchise expends a tremendous amount of effort finding ways to prevent war. Enterprise, for example, spends an entire season sending its crew on a revenge mission only to wind up fighting alongside most of the Zindi factions to liberate the region from a greater foe, establishing peace between Earth and the Zindi. Peace is always the ultimate objective, not victory. When victory is the goal, the ends justify the means, as they always do in Star Wars. Everything I did, I did for the rebellion. And every time I walked away from something I wanted to forget, I told myself it was for a cause that I believed in. A cause that was worth it. Our Federation heroes, on the other hand, do not have that luxury. Which is part of the reason why I find Deep Space Nine the most intriguing out of all the iterations of Star Trek. That show spends five freaking seasons trying to avoid a war that is ultimately inevitable. Do y'all remember this? It's a fake! That floridly gruesome bit of acting comes from one of the best episodes of the series, in which Sisko is given an impossible choice. Well, for a Starfleet officer anyway. The Federation and its allies are losing the war, and they need to convince the Romulans to join them. Which the Romulans won't do unless the Dominion commits an act of war against them. The question Bashir asked way back in Season 3... If push comes to shove, if something disastrous happens to the Federation, if we are frightened enough or desperate enough, how would we react? Would we stay true to our ideals or would we just stay here? Right back where we started. Finally gets its answer. And if your conscience is bothering you, you should soothe it with the knowledge that you may have just saved the entire Alpha Quadrant and all it cost was the life of one Romulan senator, one criminal, and the self-respect of one Starfleet officer. I don't know about you, but I'd call that a bargain. 
The show, of course, is fully aware of how far Sisko has gone to save what he once euphemistically called paradise. The entire episode is framed as a confession. Sisko delivers his personal log directly to the camera, an intensely intimate stylistic choice that underscores his feelings of guilt and uncertainty. Even the little touch of having him remove his tunic adds to the sense of intimacy and trust this episode builds with the audience. And, well, I'll just let this bit speak for itself. I lied. I cheated. I bribed men to cover the crimes of other men. I am an accessory to murder. But the most damning thing of all, I think I can live with it. And if I had to do it all over again, I would. Garrick was right about one thing. A guilty conscience is a small price to pay for the safety of the Alpha Quadrant. So I will learn to live with it. Because I can live with it. I can live with it. Computer. Erase that entire personal log. Although Star Trek isn't a particularly expressive show in terms of its visuals, it does have a few subtle tendencies that communicate its ideals. The original series, for example, made a conscious effort to cram as many crew members into its wide shots as possible, in part to emphasize their unity and their equality. Obviously there are practical benefits to this too, fewer setups, more efficient shooting days, but this brightly lit, colorful tableau of collective egalitarian strength became somewhat of a signature for the franchise. The bridge of the Enterprise-D, apart from being a cringeworthy artifact of an age when humanity inexplicably decided that beige was the color of cutting-edge technology, was similarly bathed in bright, shadowless light, its crew regularly photographed in wide shots that look somewhat theatrical. But when the Enterprise-C gets pulled through time into the present, disrupting the timeline and throwing the crew into an alternate existence where the Federation is at war with the Klingon Empire, this happens. This is the moment the show lets you know that the look it has crafted up to this point, which can easily be seen as bland or even downright ugly compared to the type of lighting we typically see in other science fiction fare, has actually been a deliberate choice, not a product of antiquated television sensibilities. Now darkness bathes the bridge. Sharp contrasts make the characters pop from the background with harsh backlights and isolating spotlights. Oppositions of light, shadow, and color clash on their faces. This is how the show chooses to depict the state of war that is... Not the way it's supposed to be. In terms of lighting and color, what's wrong in Star Trek is right in Star Wars, and vice versa. The clear oppositions necessary for Star Wars to function, light and dark, good and evil, oppressors and the oppressed, are reflected in a visual status quo that characterizes almost every moment of intense spiritual or moral conflict. It's only until a character experiences moral doubt, in other words, when good and evil become difficult to distinguish, that the flatter, low contrast look dominates. For Star Trek, on the other hand, the ambiguity of right and wrong is something to be treasured. Since the goal is to resolve conflicts, not win them, it is imperative that everyone is made to understand their opponents as people, not as monsters. Unlike the ineffective negotiators and politicians in that galaxy far, far away... So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause. Here, everyone who wears this uniform is expected to be a skilled ambassador. Where the Jedi hardly get to sit down at the table before someone tries to waste them, the table is where Starfleet's most important work is done. To the ceasefire. Wouldn't have been possible without the help of our human friends. And to the successful continuation of these talks on Andoria. 
trust they'll be more accomplished than just talk. Uh, now, at this point, I have to make a small, awkward tangent to address the issue of the Star Trek films. Movies typically demand visual styles that have more pizzazz than the understated look characteristic of the TV shows, which is why this turns into this. But more importantly, Star Trek has never really fit comfortably into the medium of blockbuster films because of their necessity for unambiguous heroes and villains. The films have often struggled to remain consistent with the ethos of the franchise, ironically because they often try a little too hard to be like Star Wars. Now, I like the 2009 reboot a lot, but this moment... This is Captain James C. Kirk of the USS Enterprise. Your ship is compromised, too close to the singularity to survive without assistance which we are willing to provide. Captain, what are you doing? You show them compassion may be the only way to earn peace with Romulus. It's logic, Spock. I thought you'd like that. No, not really. Not this time. I would rather suffer the end of Romulus a thousand times. I would rather die in agony than accept assistance from you. You got it. Arm phases, fire everything we've got. Yes, sir. That is not very Star Trek at all. In contrast, this moment, from a movie I personally can't stand, I will personally lead a landing party to an abandoned city on the surface of Kronos, where we will capture the fugitive John Harrison and return him to Earth so he can face judgment for his actions. Well, that feels a lot more like Star Trek to me. So, at the risk of making a no true Scotsman fallacy, I feel that too many of the Star Trek films, regardless of their quality, just don't get what Star Trek is really all about. It's either that, or I admit the entire premise of this essay is flawed, so... His brain is gone. I guess that's up to you to decide. As it is for you to decide how you will engage with your world. As a Jedi, fighting a war for survival against implacable and unrepentant foes with slim possibilities for redemption. Or as a Starfleet officer, fighting only when necessary to preserve a delicate peace forging unpleasant compromises that unite us by law, as they might, one day, unite us in spirit. The clouds explode, and then the desert blows. Thank you everyone for your patience. It took me forever to get around to this, and forever to edit. But I will be making a serious effort to put out more content in the coming months. I'll be experimenting with new types of videos, both longer and shorter. So please, share and subscribe. And again, thank you.